At the primary level, we introduced the students to the topography of the ocean floor. And that was using that primitive ocean floor box. And it was a two-dimensional model. Now from Science Kit, I've got this great activity called the Obsertainer Lab. And it consists of a series of 24 different containers with a ball bearing inside and some type of barrier or barricade that the ball will roll around on. This activity directly challenges the students' critical thinking skills. You have them take a few minutes with each one, and there's 12 different ones, 24 in total, and run some indirect tests on it and see where it turns at and where it hits at and, and what the shape of the container is inside and have them make a guess at what they think it is and then go on to another one. There's lots of varied shapes. Here's one here that would have a shape like this and the student should be able to, after a few minutes, pick up an idea of what that shape is inside. Then you can have them put their data on the board, have three students go up what they think number one is, for example, and you can evaluate the data and eventually open the little containers up to see how many people got them right. It's a good activity and it does challenge the students' critical thinking skills. Now we want to go one step beyond this. And we want to get back to this ocean floor concept, but we want to go to a three-dimensional model. And I call it the 3D ocean floor box. What it is, is a particular shape inside made of flour and salt water solution that's hardened up. An ocean floor contour. And we have a grid pattern, A through K this way, 1 through 22 this way. The students working in teams, well, using a barbecue skewer, will check particular points. This particular point, of course, being A1. They'll pinch it off when it hits the bottom, pull it out, and measure it. And it's best to use centimeters. We're getting them used to the metric measuring system again. Record that data. That's important for A1. Continue to do every number in row A and record that data, and then cut out a contour of just that one row across. And I'm going to show you a contour map now in the graphics. Along the top, we have the columns, 1 through 22. And in the vertical axis, we have the depth from 0 to 9, and that's centimeters. We have the top of the surface of the ocean that's shown, and we have the bottom, the deepest point. The students plot individual points. In this case, it would be for row A, and the A must be entered in the row mark at the bottom of the page. After they've connected all the points with a line, they cut along the line with a pair of scissors and cut along the bottom tab. Then we take these contours and we glue them onto this piece of cardboard. Here's the one for A. We went and did every other one. Here's the one for C and E and G and I. And we start to get a three-dimensional picture of what this mystery ocean floor looks like. It appears that there's a, a few small foothills or volcanoes rising up over on this side, and then a larger range that seems to be building up as it comes toward A, and then tapering off with very few hills or volcanoes over here. Once your students have established this model this, by this indirect observation method, then you can go ahead and allow them to open up the ocean floor box and take a look at what the actual ocean floor looks like. And how close were they? Well, they picked up the volcanoes in here and the hill and then the flat plain. So this is a good approximation. We're working on developing the students' critical thinking skills with this experiment using indirect observation. And another point to bring out is what would our results look like if we took more measurements? We started doing B and D and the ones in between. We'd start to pick up more contours, things that we wouldn't normally see. So it's important to show that the more measurements you make, the better your approximation is of the real thing. And this is what science is all about. In our ocean floor box, when your students make them, have them mix three cups of flour, three cups of salt, and one and a half cups of water in a big bowl, slop it in the box, have them mold it to the shape they want, and then let it dry. You should probably review some of the ocean floor shapes before they go ahead and do this. You never know what you're going to get. Once the grid pattern is inscribed on the top, have students in the group poke holes in all the little cross points with a large nail. It takes a little time, so you need more than one student to work on this project. Then make sure that the top is taped down tight to keep those kids from peeking. 
and also make sure that there's a number on the box so that you can cross-reference it to the particular maps. Most of the information we know about the ocean floor comes from echo sounding. Echo sounders draw a continuous picture of the ocean floor. Sonar, which stands for sound, navigation, and ranging, uses a beam of sound much like a beam of light from a searchlight. This beam of sound travels very fast in water, about 4,800 feet per second, or 3,000 miles per hour, or about four times faster than it travels in air. Finding the depth of the ocean, then, is just a matter of measuring the time interval from when the sound leaves the ship until when the echo returns. Let's try this math problem. If it takes one second for the sound to make the round trip to the bottom and back, and it is traveling at 4,800 feet per second, how deep is the water? Well, we can show the answer by seeing that the depth is equal to one-half the time in seconds times the speed, which is 4,800 feet per second. Remember, it has to make the round trip. The answer is 2,400 feet deep. Most of the ocean floor is much deeper than this and is called the abyssal plains, with an average depth of about four kilometers or two and a half miles. If you've ever run a 10K, that distance will take you from sea level to the deepest point of the ocean, the trenches. Compared to our land features, the trenches are very deep. If you put Mount Everest in the Marianas Trench, there would still be a mile of water over the top of its summit. Trenches are formed where the seafloor is slowly being driven under, back into the earth. The abyssal plains are smoother and flatter than any plains found on land. They are mostly basalt, covered by sediments. On them we may find hills and volcanic peaks. Some volcanic peaks break the surface and form islands like Hawaii. Others that do not are called seamounts. When a volcano is eroded by waves, it makes a flat top seamount under the surface. These are called geos. A main feature of the ocean floor is an underwater mountain chain called the Mid-Ocean Ridge. Next to it is a deep valley called the Mid-Ocean Rift. From this rift comes new seafloor material, slowly pushing outward in both directions. As we look closer to the shoreline, we find the continental shelf. This is really an extension of the continent itself and varies in width. Where mountains are close to the shore, such as Peru, the shelf is usually narrow. The average width is about 75 kilometers or 45 miles. The continental slope is the transition between the shelf and the ocean basin. The outer edge of this slope is really the boundary of a continent. Most of our ocean floor is still unexplored and remains yet to be mapped. Now here is a great way to illustrate that the Earth is 75% water and 25% land. It involves getting a bunch of small squares, uniform in size, green for the land and blue for the water, and having your students tape them all over the globe. And you have to remind them in advance to compensate for areas where the square doesn't fit perfectly over land and takes up a little water. It should be compensated somewhere else with a blue square. After this activity is almost completed, you should have a globe covered with squares. Then it's just a matter of counting them up. I like to use pencil marks so then I can hunt for the ones I missed. Once you've counted them up, you should find that the blue ones, the water ones, are 75% of the total, and the green ones are the other 25. If you didn't come up with this number, you might ask your students why, and then you start to study different kinds of errors that might have caused uh, discrepancies in the results. Now we're working on a lot of important concepts in this. We're working on geography, we're working on science and oceanography, and we're working on a primary understanding of calculus, because that's what calculus is, approximating an area with a bunch of tiny squares. I'm sure every one of you has probably had this happen to you, where you've had your coffee pot plugged in and you forgot about it, and all the water evaporated away and left that brown coffee residue behind. Well, we're going to use that principle, and it's not going to hurt your coffee pot, and we're going to see how much salt is in one liter of seawater. Now it's supposed to be 35 grams. Incidentally, if you want to make it beforehand, 35 grams is a little less than two tablespoons and one liter of water. Mix it up, pour it in. If you can use real seawater, all the better. 
I already have a sample mixed up here. It's important to have a good balance. Every elementary school should have at least one good balance. This is a double beam balance. And it says here that my coffee pot weighs 366 grams. It's also important to weigh your coffee pot dry. There can't be any water in it. Okay, we pour the sample, the seawater sample in, which I've previously mixed. One liter. We set it on our coffee pot and we just let all the water evaporate away. Make sure that you don't leave the coffee pot on overnight for safety's sake. Once all the water's evaporated away, you'll have a coffee pot with a bunch of salt inside. You want to weigh it again. Then you subtract the first weight from the second weight. The difference will be the amount of salt that was in one liter of seawater. Should be 35 grams. Ten hours later, I look at my coffee pot and the liter of water's boiled away and I've got this strange white residue in the bottom. It doesn't even look like the salt I started with. So I go and weigh it. And what do I find out? I've got 38 grams of salt. I started with 35. Somewhere I gained three grams along the way. You have to deal with these kind of errors when you come upon them. Probably the best conclusion is that there's still some water tied up in there, about three grams. And a good way to test this is to put it back on the heat and heat it up and then reweigh it again. Now you can see how we can develop our problem solving ability using experiments like this and studying oceanography. And regardless of whether you live on the coast or in the central part of the continent, the ocean is of importance to all of us. For example, the ocean controls our weather and climate as we take a look at meteorology next.